from verse 1. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase, and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your hearts that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and the hills, a land with wheat, barley, vines, and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce, and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron, and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your hearts will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land, with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he saw to your ancestors as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. This is the word of God. They could finally hear it. The sound of roaring water. They could finally smell it. The sweet fragrance of wild herbs and flowers. And they could finally see it. The land flowing with milk and honey. Picture the scene with me this morning. Israel has arrived on the banks of the Jordan River. And as they look across the Jordan River, they look into the land of Canaan, the land that God had promised would be their own. They've arrived. For 40 years, this nation has been wandering around in a desert. Just, just picture the people, tired, weary, potentially having, having thought that God's given up on them. And yet now they stand on the edge of the Jordan. I'm sure they were singing. There was dancing, there was weeping, people were embracing each other. The joy that they must have felt in that moment was unspeakable. And I wonder if there was maybe a little catchphrase that started to develop amongst the people. 
I wonder if maybe starting with kind of one tent and then to the next and then to the next, there was a little bit of a hashtag that started to develop. Hashtag, we've arrived. And as you sit here this morning at the end of 2019, this is the last Sunday of the year. Is it that maybe you've adopted this little catchphrase for your life? Hashtag, I've arrived. Because I think Jason's right. I have spoken to many people over the course of this year, and it's just amazing to me how many people have said that 2019 kicked their backsides. I mean, it was a hard year in so many ways. So many people I've spoken to have, have, have told me that they've experienced what James was talking about, trials of many kinds, financial trials in our country, relational trials, spiritual trials. And maybe it's been longer than 2019. Maybe this wilderness of 2019 has extended back 2018, 2017, 2016. I don't know. But maybe as you sit here this morning, you feel like it's done. The wilderness is over. I'm done wandering around in the desert. I can see the promised land. 2020 is gonna be a good year. There are good things in store for me in 2020. And maybe there are some exciting things on the horizon for you. Maybe there's a new job opportunity. Maybe it's your first year out of school and you get to look forward to going to varsity or to doing something else. Maybe there's an exciting relationship on the cards, a marriage, or, or you're expecting a child. Maybe it's that we're getting a new senior pastor here at Rosebank, and there's some exciting changes on the horizon for us as a church. You see, Israel had arrived. The people are high-fiving, the mood is great, it's no longer doom and gloom in that camp. They're dreaming about a great future. And I picture Moses, their leader, just before they crossed, maybe they gathered on a hillside, I picture Moses kind of gathering the people together. He wants to say something to them. And maybe the people are, are thinking, yeah, I, know, I know Moses, he's gonna, he's gonna do this kind of last big hoorah. He's, he's gonna get us ready for this crossing. Maybe he's gonna tell us sort of some logistics, where we're gonna cross, when we're gonna cross, what we need to take with us, which wetsuit to pack, uh, last one across the river is a rotten egg. I don't know, but the people are excited because Moses is gonna tell them about this great crossing and the land that they can look forward to. But, Moses is looking very serious. As Moses is gathering the people together, it looks like he's very intent. There's something that he wants to tell these people. There's a message that he wants to get across. So the people start looking a little bit nervous and they kind of gather together. And then the first words that come out of Moses' mouth, verse one, Israel, be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. And that went down like a lead balloon. People are like, Moses, like, why, why are you being like this? This is a joyous occasion. Why so serious? But anyway, they know Moses well enough, so they know that they've got to listen to what he says. So, so they, sh okay, let's, let's just listen. What is it that Moses wants us to hear and be careful to follow? And then Moses says this one word. Everything he is about to say hinges on this one word. The people need to be careful to Remember, that's what it says right at the front of verse two. But what does Moses want us to remember, the Israelites are asking? And as we, as we unpack the text this morning, we're gonna see that 
Moses wanted the Israelites to remember three things about God. Three specific things. And if you feel this morning as though potentially you're like Israel, 2019 is done, there's a new season ahead. I think Moses wants us to remember God and to remember three specific things about him. So the first thing that we see Moses encouraging the people to remember is to remember God who leads. Verse two, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. And then in verse 15, he repeats the command. He led you through a vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. Is there anyone here who's ever spent some time in a desert? Maybe you've just walked through a desert, maybe you've had the opportunity to camp in a desert, sleep in a desert. But, but if you know anything about a desert, you'll know that a desert is a dangerous place. A desert is vast. I mean, everywhere you look, it's just sand. It's so easy to get lost in a desert. Deserts are hot by day, so hot that the sun can kill you. And then at night, there's the risk of dying from the cold. There's very little water, there's very little to eat, and if you're not careful, you might just stand on one of the many venomous creatures that live in a desert, hidden underneath the sand, an adder or a scorpion. Deserts are dangerous. This is where Israel has been for 40 years, and yet now they stand looking at the promised land. This was no doing of Israel's. It's not as though Moses was an expert at Google Maps or someone got a drone for Christmas and sent it out across the land to kind of figure out how to get out there. No, they had no idea where they were going and yet now they found themselves on the verge of the promised land. The Bible tells us that from day one, God led these people by a pillar of cloud in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. All the way. Yeah, but Dave, they spent 40 years in the desert. What do you mean God was leading them? That wasn't God's fault. The people spent time in the desert because they needed to because of their sin. But God directed their steps to the point where they were standing on the edge of the promised land. Moses was telling these people to look back before they go anywhere and remember how God led them. And if your hashtag is, I've arrived at the end of 2019, this season, and you feel as though uh, the wilderness has come to an end, I think Moses would encourage you to remember the God who has led you. As you look back over your life, do you see his leading? Do you see his leading in the deserts? Maybe you've been lost at times and God has put you back on track. Maybe he's protected you from those venomous desert creatures. Maybe you've needed direct answers at at kind of crossroad moments in your life and God has directed you. Maybe you've traveled through hills, valleys, And God has been with you by your side. I don't think there's anyone here who can disagree that God leads us over the course of our lives. Proverbs says that he directs our steps. So if you sense that this new season is coming and and it's got some exciting things in store for you, Moses is encouraging you to not forget how God led you. Secondly, Moses encourages the people to remember God who provides. I mean, as we look back over Israel's history, we cannot 
say, we cannot dispute the fact that God had provided for this people in incredible ways. As we just look at the last part of verse 14, God brought you out of Egypt, Moses says to them, out of the land of slavery. Well, let's go back to Egypt for a moment. You see, there was a time when this nation was in slavery to the Egyptians, to a ruthless people. They lived in slavery, in harsh conditions. They worked, worked to the bone. And Pharaoh, the leader's heart was hard. And there was no way he was letting them go. And then God provided for them a man by the name of Moses. And God used this man, Moses, to perform wonders in that nation, plagues and all sorts of signs and wonders to the point where Pharaoh had a moment of softening and he said, fine, I've had it. You can let these people go. Get out of my sight. God rescued Israel from Egypt. And then quickly, Pharaoh's heart hardened again and he gave chase. And the entire Egyptian army was after Israel. And then they got to the sea and there behind them is the Egyptian army and there in front of them is a sea. Well, where to now? What does God do? He splits it. He makes a pathway down the sea, two walls of water. Israel gets to walk right through. That's provision. And then, and then as they're through, and the Egyptian army's giving chase, these walls of water come crashing down, drowning out the entire army. And then as they start walking through the desert, God provides a law, some principles for them to live by, to be governed by. He provides them with basic resources, clothes. Verse 15 and 16, he brought you water out of the rock, out of a rock. And he gave you manna to eat in the wilderness. God was looking after this nation every step of the way. God provided them with leaders like Moses and Aaron and he provided them with his presence. No, Israel, as you go into the promised land, you cannot forget how God has provided for you. Is there evidence of God's provision in your life? Has he not provided you with the resources you need to live? Food, Water, shelter, jobs, families, friends, a church. God looks after us, doesn't he? Sometimes we look at other people and we think, well, I don't have as much as they do. Surely God's not providing for me. Well, God's not saying that he's gonna always give you the things that you want. But he does give us what we need. None of us can accuse God of being one who doesn't provide for his children. And I think it's important together with Israel that we look back over our lives and we remember God who provides. And then lastly, we see Moses encouraging the people of Israel to remember God who blesses. Let's read together from verse seven. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. This is a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills. There's gonna be no more trying to get water out of a hard rock. This place is gonna be littered, covered with water. You're never gonna lack water. What a contrast. A land with wheat and barley, Vines and fig, sorry, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, rockamomas. Okay, mate, sorry, that's a different, I've got a different version to you. Uh, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing. I mean, the abundance of food, diverse food. They can pick whatever they want. The blessing of God. A land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. There are gonna be raw materials here for you, Israel, to build buildings and establish yourselves in this new land. 
when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. You see, not only had God provided the basics for Israel, here we see his heart to bless his people. And what was his heart? What was the message he wanted to convey to them? I love you. I really love you, Israel. Every single one of you as individuals, I love you. And I'm your God and I'm committed to you. And I want to establish you on this earth and I want you to remain and live in my love and enjoy me. But I also want you to enjoy good things. I want to bless you and I want you to be a blessing to the world around you. And Moses was calling the people to remember the heart of God through all the good things that had come from his hand. So if you potentially stand on the cusp of some good things to enjoy, take some time to remember that they come from the hand of God and ultimately they reveal his heart of love for you. Take time to also look back over your life. Don't forget the way that God has blessed you. Houses, jobs, families, Marriages, kids, holidays, Christmas presents, cars, fancy clothes, TVs, music, internet, schools, universities, degrees, good health. God gives us good gifts, doesn't he? Let us not forget the God who blesses. So in summary, Israel had arrived, about to cross. And you may feel that you've arrived on the edge of a new season. But Moses' warning is clear. Don't forget the Lord your God. Remember. Remember the God who has led you, who has provided for you, and who has blessed you. And you may be sitting here and you may be like, Dave, what are you talking about? I'm still in the wilderness. There's nothing on the cards for me. 2020, I don't know, I think it's gonna suck just as much as 2019. Maybe that's you. But I think it's important that we also, I'm in a bit of a wilderness, if I'm honest, we also need to remember God in our wilderness season. Because it's as we remember God that we find perspective and encouragement. And remembering doesn't mean that we always feel. One of the daily choices that we must make as Christians is to choose to believe what we know to be true over what we feel to be true. To choose to believe that if God says he loves you, even if you don't feel it, that he's telling the truth. If God says he's in control of your life, either he's a liar or he's telling the truth. If God says that he has not left you and is working in your circumstances, even in your wilderness, for your good, he's either lying or he's telling the truth. But you and I, if we're in a wilderness season, can make a choice that goes beyond how we might feel. We may feel as though God has forsaken us. But won't you join me in faith today by choosing to believe differently, by choosing to remember that God leads, provides, and blesses. And let that serve to be a great encouragement that he'll continue to do that in the future. And his time will bring us out of our wilderness situations. But I can imagine that, that Israel was asking a question at this point. Okay, Moses, we get it. You want us to remember God. But why? Why do we need to remember God, Moses? Why is this so critical? And if we go back to those first words of Moses in verse one, we get a clue. Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today. Verse two, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Verse six, observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. Are we starting to see a pattern? 
Verse 11, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day. You see, the reason why Israel needed to remember the Lord their God is because they were about to step into a land filled with temptation. Temptation that they hadn't experienced potentially in 40 years. There were gonna be new things to love and to enjoy. It would be easy for them. I don't need God, look at all I've got. To forget the Lord their God and therefore to no longer walk in obedience to him. And had this not been the theme for Israel from the beginning, God saying to them, I am your God. I am committed to you. I love you. I lead, I provide, I bless, and I want you to love me in return. And the way you demonstrate that is by living in obedience to my commands. That was God's heart for them, this two-way relationship of love between him and his people. He knew that if they remained obedient to him, they would enjoy him. They would live in peace. They would have life. They would have satisfaction. So the way that Israel would stay obedient to God was for them to be mindful of him, to intentionally remember him. And so I think it's important that we need to be intentional about remembering the Lord our God. So let me ask us, do we have things in our day that help us remember God? Do we spend time with him at some point in the day, reflecting on his goodness, reflecting on his character, reading his word? Do we listen to music where the the truths from God's word might sing over us? Do we meet with people who point us to God, who encourage us to keep looking at him, and remembering him. And as we do that, as God is on our minds and we're intentional about remembering him, what happens is our hearts become grateful and grateful hearts lead to obedient hearts. Simple, right? (laughs) Not really. Because there's a problem. This nation Israel was notorious for one thing. Who can guess? for forgetting God. Think about Exodus. I was reading it the other day. I mean, they've just been rescued in this profound way. I mean, it is miraculous. Three days after this incredible rescue. I mean, I would hope that I'd be someone who'd still be in awe after three days. But what do we read in Exodus is after three days, the people start grumbling to Moses because there's nothing to drink. And then just two months later, I mean, that's not a long time. Just two months later, they've had enough of the desert. So this is what they say to to Moses. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. I'm like, come on, guys. Like, that's ridiculous. Do you honestly want to go back to slavery in Egypt? You'd rather sit around pots of meat and then work yourself to the bone every single day. God has rescued you. He's provided for you. And every time they grumbled and made statements like this, God provided. He brought them food and water. We see that from Deuteronomy 8. So why is it that suddenly think that, why is it that they suddenly think God wouldn't continue to do that for them in the future? But this was a nation who, although God provided over and over again, they continued to forget the Lord their God. And this was the pattern we know throughout their history. And this is the very reason that God didn't take them straight from Egypt into the promised land and let them wander around in this wilderness for 40 years because they weren't ready. He used the wilderness experience to discipline this nation, to humble this nation, to test this nation, to see what was in their heart and to show them how prone they were to forgetting the Lord their God, to show them how they thought they had no need for him. They were selfish and prideful. It's not on the screens, but I'm just gonna read verses two to five. Just listen to the way that the Lord used this wilderness experience. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. Why? 
to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then he feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. That's why they were in this wilderness, because God needed to do some heart work. You know, I've been a Christian for about, about 16 years now. And I clearly remember the day when I kind of, man, I was hit in the face by my own sin and the way that I just had rebelled against God. In fact, I really struggled with thinking that I was just this Pharisee type person. I really thought God owed it to me because I had lived a really moral life up until that point. But I remember the day when I clearly understood the good news the gospel message of Jesus Christ for the first time. It was an incredible encounter. I felt so loved and forgiven and received by my God. And, and throughout my Christian life, I have experienced God in ways like this over and over again. Heard his affirming words over my life. You're my son. When my father passed away a number of years ago, you're my son. I love you. God has come through for me over and over again. He's provided me with a great church, great friends and family. So many things. God has looked after me. He's led me. He's encouraged my soul. And yet, do you know what? Over and over again, I do the very same thing as Israel. I forget the Lord my God. I turn to other things. I I love the things that he gives me more than him sometimes. I love my own agenda more than his. I'm selfish. I'll give you an example. So uh, my wife is a, sc- a school teacher. She's on holiday at the moment. And because I've been working throughout, I haven't taken leave over this December period. She's had the, had the girls and bless, the, bless them, they're amazing. But they are a handful at times. And she's had to kind of have these girls every single day of the holiday and entertain them and, and look after them and feed them and give, you know, dress them and all those sorts of things. And, and it is, it's hard work. For those of your parents, you'll know. But anyway, last weekend, I had the weekend off. And um, yeah, my wife hasn't had too much time off in the holiday and she, um, you know, Sunday came and guess what I did? I decided to sleep in. So I guess we got up early with the girls. My wife got up early, she gave them breakfast, she fed them and then we decided to visit Parkhurst. So we were there in the service and then the kids went out for Sunday school. Guess who left with the kids to go out to Sunday school? No, not me. Um, My wife went out, and then after the service, I grabbed a cup of coffee, didn't really go and look for them and see if she needed help, and there she comes walking up the steps with two plastic bikes and the kids hanging on each leg, and I just just didn't help. I wasn't helpful. And she had to remind me that, Dave, I feel like you were a little bit selfish, and she was absolutely right. I was very selfish. I just wanted my time. Even yesterday, I mean, yesterday, cricket was on, I'm chilling at home, but my wife was out for the day, she went to movies, and she had some admin to do, and I started grumbling in my heart, like, I just, like, I want to do my own thing, I don't want to have to, like, play and do puzzles, and that's the, that's the state of my heart. Is it possible, though, this morning, church, that you have a heart like mine? like Israel's? Is it possible that you forget the Lord your God on a regular basis? Maybe not in big ways, but in subtle ways. Is there pride in you or selfishness or grumbling? Do you find yourself loving God's gifts more than God himself? I mean, there's that line that that Moses says that man does not live on bread alone, and that would be their temptation in the promised land, to love the good things of God more than him. Is that potentially something you struggle with, that when circumstances are good, shop, but when they're not, then you grumble against the Lord? Maybe you give yourself credit for seasons where you seem to be prospering. You see, we are all prone to forgetting the Lord, our God. And it's no joke, according to Moses, look at verse 19 and 20. This is how serious forgetting the Lord is. If you ever 
forget the Lord your God and follow other gods. And this is not just like actual gods of other religions. It's like anything we could set up and worship as a God. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. Oh, but it's just once, Lord. I've only done that once. You will be destroyed. And the sad thing is that soon after this nation crossed into this promised land, guess what they did? Forgot the Lord their God. And they were largely destroyed. This isn't an Israel problem. This is a human problem. This is the state of all of our hearts this morning. We forget God and I guarantee we will forget him today and tomorrow and in 2020. Because that is sin. We are unable to perfectly remember him and therefore we are unable to perfectly obey him and we deserve to be destroyed. What sets us apart from Israel? So what hope is there for us this morning? What hope? If we die today and we stand before the Lord, what hope is there? It's to remember one last thing. It's to remember Jesus. In Matthew chapter four, we see Jesus Christ heading into a wilderness himself. For 40 days, he's in the wilderness. He's tested and tempted in so many ways. He's without food and without water. What does he do? He remembers the Lord, his God. He remembers his Father. And in the face of great temptation, he doesn't give in. He continues to choose God and continues to choose to obey him. And then throughout his life, we see the same thing. Sinless Jesus. When times are hard and when times are better, he's choosing God, his father. He's choosing obedience. Perfect all the way, not just to model for us, but also because at that moment when he got to that cross and he faced destruction, our destruction, in the face, what happened? He took upon our forgetting God. And the consequence of forgetting God is not just destruction, it's that God forgets you. And God in that moment couldn't look at his own son, turned away. Christ took upon what we deserve for the ways that we forget God. This is good news. And if it doesn't mean much to us this morning, there is a problem. Then we need to go before the Lord and we need to ask him to help us to understand how serious the sin of forgetting God is. And then to understand how amazing his grace is. Because when we get how serious it is, grace becomes so beautiful. Lord, that you would forgive me, that you would save me from destruction. What does that do? It transforms the human heart. And the human heart then becomes a grateful heart and a heart that loves. And the heart that loves obeys gladly. So friends, as we're on the verge of 2020, it may be a great year for you, it may be a hard year, maybe an average year, but the truth is the same for us this morning. Let us remember the Lord our God. And I wanna encourage you, maybe in this moment before I pray, just to close your eyes and to take a moment to remember Jesus and to bring to him any ways that you've forgotten him and to thank him for his incredible grace that he bore the destruction that we deserve. 